So if you're white on Turtle Island, you will have bad ancestors. There's no way to get around that. Um, you just have them. Ancestors are always with me. They're always watching me. They're always making sure that they know everything about me. They don't. There are some things that maybe they see you do that they just don't understand. Hi witches, welcome back to my channel. It's me, your local chaotic witch aunt. I took a little bit of a break in between filming the hexing in the moon kind of info video and uh, now. Just because I was like, that took so much out of me, I don't want to be on YouTube for a bit. So <laughs> I'm kind of uh, getting back into the swing of things, returning to filming um, starting this week. So let me know what kind of topics or conversations you'd like to hear me have down in the comments. As I'm kind of moving forward, I am trying to, I think, talk about things that are more my experience in my practice, especially in the reconnection sphere rather than kind of uh, basic things or like more beginner friendly things. So you're going to see a little bit of a change in that. Um, and I guess we're kind of starting it off with like this conversation of like three things we don't talk about enough in when we talk about ancestor work. And I feel like this is something that has been brewing for a while because I have seen definitely a lot of comments coming to me being like, Hey, how do I only talk to my like enlightened ancestors? And I'm like, I don't know what that means. I can't help you. <laughs> so I'm going to explain a little bit my ideas of ancestor work, how ancestors come to us. And then I'm going to talk a bit about some things that I wish we talked about more in ancestor veneration and ancestor workspaces. So ancestors is a broad term. The ancestors are like, anyone you consider an ancestor. So that includes blood ancestors, lineage ancestors, uh, non-blood ancestors, plant ancestors, sometimes saints or ancestors, ancestors of your identity. So queer ancestors, all of that fits into the ancestor area. When I talk about working with my ancestors, I typically talk about um, people I am related to by family, whether that is by blood or by association, they were like considered a part of the family, even if we weren't related. I also will typically specify when I'm talking about plant ancestors or spirit ancestors. Uh, and then I will move into kind of saints character char categorization where saints are technically like ancestors. And I have familial saints I work with a lot. This is kind of just to kind of start us off. <laughs> Cause when I say ancestors, a lot of people are like, well, I don't know the names of my ancestors. You don't have to, I don't know the, or I don't know anything. I don't talk to my like blood related family. That's not the only type of ancestor there is. Uh, so you can use that term to identify a lot of things outside of just your great grandparents or great, great, great grandparents or people within your lineage um, to include people who share your identity, such as queer ancestors. We have ancestors of our work, uh, plant ancestors, animal ancestors, all of them are there. And I want to kind of start off by saying this is kind of the topics that I feel like we should talk about more, the questions that I get the most that I wanted to open up a discussion on um, when we talk about reconnection and ancestor work. One of the biggest ones I have definitely gotten is, well, I don't, I don't have any good ancestors or I don't like my ancestors or I don't um, want to work with them, which is fine. You don't have to work with your family in order to work with ancestors. You can work with plants, you can work with animals. Those are our ancestors just as much as people. Um, if you go far enough back, you know, there will be someone who wants to work with you. I think the concept of like bad ancestors comes up a lot and the people we shouldn't be working with. So bad ancestors is a term that I'm using to describe ancestors who were morally bad people. <laughs> So if you're white on Turtle Island, you will have bad ancestors. There's no way to get around that. Um, you just have them. Like, unless your family immigrated like very, very recently from somewhere. And even then, bad ancestors exist everywhere in every family line. Um, you will always have someone in your family living 
that you don't like and don't want to talk to. So of course you're going to have someone in your family who is dead that you don't want to talk to and don't want to be around. Um, sometimes that kind of bad ancestor can be more along the lines of you two just don't get along. They don't like you. They don't agree with your choices. And sometimes that can be something more, I hate the word karmic, but like it's bigger. It's more about them upholding white supremacy, racism, their colonizers, their, they colonized people, they were harmful and held harmful ideologies that continue to hurt people today. So we have like a spectrum of bad ancestors here. If you, like I said, are white in America, you definitely had racist ancestors. That's just something you have. And I know that's gonna make someone uncomfortable, but it's this, an interesting thing because I feel like there's a lot of gotcha comments that I get where they're like, well, why would you honor your ancestors who did A, B, and C? Um, I don't. <laughs> I know which areas of my lineage there is friction with, um, and they're not people that I would ever consult with. I wouldn't ask their advice for things. I don't want to bring them into my house because I morally and fundamentally disagree with everything they stood for. And you can recognize that and recognize you have bad ancestors and not work with them, but also recognize that we can do better. And I think this is something that a lot of people, you know, uh, are iffy on. I've talked to a lot of people who are like, well, that's not my, my responsibility. Um, and some people are like, well, I don't really want to deal with that. And that's fine. Um, my kind of way of thinking is always that if we want to do better than the people who came before us, if we want to make a change um, for the minority communities and the communities that were harmed, whether that's us, people of color, Either they were like anti-Semitic queer people, we have to be able to recognize and come to terms with the fact that that harm was done. You have to look at it like straight in the face and really sit with it. I saw a, a video recently from Jasmine's Garden where you know someone had ancestors from Louisiana and she was basically like was connecting with these ancestors and I was like, why would you want to work with this? Why would you want to consult with these people? Like, why would you want to do this? And I think that is very much the space I enter when we talk about bad ancestors. We don't have to talk to the ancestors that were abhorrently bad and continue to con contain harmful ideologies and death. Uh, you don't have to go anywhere near that, but that doesn't mean that you can't notice it. They're there. You don't have to bring them into your space, but you do have to recognize the ways in which what they have done or how they were bad is like passed to you and how do we break that and like heal that lineage in a way. And a lot of times healing the lineage isn't like healing that ancestor, it's healing you and the shit that comes up with that. So this goes for like, I'm talking about more dramatic examples, but like, Bad ancestors are everywhere. There are people in every family that you don't like and don't get along with. You probably have an uncle that you're thinking of right now that you're like, oh, he's so homophobic. Or you have a great aunt that it's like, I just, she doesn't understand uh, this and she's racist. And it, it, like, you can recognize that and recognize that you have ancestors that are like that. Sometimes you have groups of people that are gonna be more morally bad than others. Um, and this is where we get to like the gotcha statements, right? Where it's like, well, why would you honor these ancestors if they did this? And I'm like, well, I don't. And I think it's interesting because there's a lot of nuance that we have to talk about with ancestor work because I don't work with one side of my family. I just don't, I don't talk to them um, because I don't like what they stood for and I don't like how they, you know, operated their lives. Um, and I don't feel like they will bring anything to my ancestor veneration practice, except for like the most recent ancestors who were like my grandparents who I loved, because that is something that I have a personal connection with. But even when we talk about ancestor veneration with ancestors on like, my Italian immigrant side, there's always gonna be that bit of friction. And so we kind of getting into like 
boundaries are okay to set with your ancestors. You can say, hey, no. Because in truth, you are, <laughs> this sounds terrible, you're the one who's living right now. Um, they are dead. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't honor and venerate them and show them respect. But if they, and I had this happen recently with my like great, great, great grandma that I have been bringing into my practice. Um, she doesn't like a lot of things about my house. She doesn't like the way I dress. She doesn't like the fact that the house is dirty. She doesn't like the altar is dirty. There's dust everywhere. She doesn't like my blinds. She like, so she is someone who in life was considered a difficult woman and definitely like liked things a certain way. And so when you bring that ancestor who behaved that way into your space, you are gonna get that no matter what. She is by far the most kind of difficult ancestor that I've connected with and worked with that really is like pushing my boundaries. I haven't had to set any boundaries with my family before. They've all been very kind of kind and respectful. Uh, she likes things a certain way. So we had to compromise with certain ways that I approach her, how I dress when I call on her um, and approach her, how I keep the altar space clean and what she receives out of that. And I think that is the epitome of ancestor work is you're not just like you're meeting people people are always gonna have things you don't like about them and things you do like because they're family and this is aside from the really morally bad stuff that you should not be consulting with those people if you are in a space where you're someone who is queer you are disabled, there's a very strong chance that there are queer and disabled people in your lineage. You are not the first person. Your family does not hate you and is not disappointed in you because they are not, you are not the same as them. And every once in a while you have an ancestor who's like, I don't like the way you do things. And you can just be like, suck it up, I don't care. It's that easy. And that's kind of the conversation I have with my great, great, great grandma. She's like, I don't like any of this. And I'm like, okay, firstly, I'm gonna dress however I want when I'm not around you. And you don't get to say anything about that because I make the decisions around here. I am in charge. You are in my house. Uh, secondly, I can do this, but the rest of the house is gonna be dirty when it's dirty. It's gonna be clean when it's clean. You can just let it happen. You're just gonna have to deal with that. Here's my compromise. I will dress modestly when I call on you and when I approach you, hence why I'm dressed modestly today. And I will keep your altar space more clean. And that was the compromise. Um, and there were more kind of things that we worked on, like with my friend, uh, I did the session through Sterling Moon, but there are a lot of things about me that my, you know, originally my ancestors didn't like. Like my, this ancestor specifically was like, why is your house fucking dusty? I live with a dog, you know? Like it's, and I had to explain to her, so the way that you took care of your family is the way that I am taking care of my family now. But mine is work. I am working and the work I do means that sometimes I don't have the space to always keep the house clean. I don't have the space to always keep the kitchen clean. And so explaining that to her allowed her some space in that. She also like, I had to explain a lot of things to her because she was kind of just put into my space and we haven't been able to connect since then. Um, I wasn't sure how, she wasn't sure how to connect with me. Um, and so there's this meeting halfway that needs to happen in every situation. And sometimes you can meet an ancestor halfway and you can say, oh, I don't like you. I don't like the way you're doing this. And then you can say, no, you can take them off the altar. There's no shame in taking an ancestor off the altar. Everyone has ancestors that they work more closely with and ancestors that they work less closely with. That is normal. When we talk about, you know, boundaries, it really is saying like, okay, here's my line. Don't cross it. And here's the thing is their family. Family's always going to push and prod at that line. And there's always going to be someone who toes it. Don't let them cross it. And that's okay, you don't need to do anything other than recognize that you have to uh, verbalize the line. These are the things that I like to talk about because I've heard the concept that like only the enlightened ancestors will come to you. I don't know where this concept comes from. 
or like the, the way it was said, it was like along the lines of like, uh, how do I make sure I only draw the good ancestors to me? There is no way to ensure <laughs> that you're drawing good ancestors. I mean, I, I, cause like, here's the thing is like, you can pick and choose who you bring in. Um, but once you get to a point where you didn't know anything about them, you don't know their names or anything like that. Um, you don't really know what you're getting. So you can say, oh, I didn't like this person in my family. I'm not putting them on my ancestor altar, but you can like uh, create protection around that. I'm very intentional with my ancestor altar. The only, I only have like my one side of my family that's on my ancestor altar because they were the side of my family who were immigrants and I'm not putting the side of the family who is like morally, objectively racist and bad on the same altar as the immigrant side of my family. But I think it's interesting when we get to the space of like bad ancestors is I think a lot of people don't recognize that like you, all of us have ancestors who are bad. Some of them were morally and horrifyingly bad. And a lot of the times when you have that, the person you're talking to doesn't work with them. I don't know a single person who does ancestor veneration who purposely seeks out the really racist, terrible ancestors and says, what do you think about this? It's usually the side of the family that has more of a prolific impact. It's the cultural side of the family. And sometimes people don't even work with their families. They work with the plants, they work with the animals. And that is always a way you can go because those are ancestors that still have things to teach us. Another question I get a lot is, well, I don't know my ancestors' names. You don't have to. I think that that's, you can know the ancestors' names. It's more potent when you're calling them in. Um, but you can really just honor ancestors known and unknown and ask them to come in and support you and make themselves known and present. You can honor an ancestor without ever knowing what their face like looks like or what their name is with just a white candle addressed to ancestors known and unknown. Open that kind of space up for them to come in and go from there. You don't have to in any way say, this is, you know, like I only want to work with the ancestors who are known. Nah, you can keep going. You can keep going back. It's I, another video I saw on Instagram where it's like, you don't like your recent ancestors? Go back further, go to the plants, go to the animals. And I'm like, they're right. In my opinion, ancestor veneration is about lineage. It's about, upholding and learning from those who came before us who have so much knowledge to give, whether that's the rose bush in your yard or your, you know, great, great, great aunt who has like a lot of, who was like also queer and disabled or who was really, had did the folk magic and was a healer. Um, and I think I see ancestor veneration a lot in cultures all over just as a sign of respect and veneration and legacy. and recognizing that you can respect the fact that your ancestors, so many of them were there in order to get you here without ever inviting them into your home, without ever seeking their counsel on certain things. That is an act of work. Veneration with the ancestors, you can be like, thank you so much for all you did to make me born. I don't want to talk to you. I'll see you later. Uh, <laughs> Work is actively bringing them into the space, actively really asking for their assistance on things, actively learning from them. And I really only work with the side of my family that comes from South Italy. And also my grandfather, but he also is just like hanging out. So he's like, wants ice cream, you know, he's hanging. But those, the ones I work with are like the three previous matriarchs and lines on my, South Italian side. And then I venerate that side of the family, but I don't necessarily work with everyone over there. And I don't necessarily ask for advice from everyone over there. And then on the other side, I don't actually talk to work or really hold space for anyone on the other side of the family. So it's really interesting because I think ancestor veneration and ancestor work, when you're talking about like reconnection, um, recovering something that has been lost, recovering something that has been really like taken away, um, maybe by someone on the other side of your family, they were a part of what caused your family to lose that culture. It really is an act of healing and desettling. 
it's recognizing the ways in which we have assimilated into the culture we're in and in which ways that's problematic and which ways our ancestors were problematic too. You don't have to continue on a legacy of problematic ideology that is harmful to you as a person and the people around you. You can say, all right, no. And sometimes the ancestors you work with will have some of those problematic beliefs, like my great 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 grandma who's like, why aren't you, why are you dressed like a slut? <laughs> Why are you wearing shorts in a sports bra? What are you doing? That is one example of it that's very mild that we had a disagreement on. And I was like, I'm gonna dress however I want, whenever I want, except when I'm talking to you. And out of respect, I will wear, dress modestly when I approach you and call on you. But sometimes it's disagreements like that. And sometimes it's, oh, I don't like your vibes, bye. And that's normal. And okay, because like I said, everyone has someone they're thinking of right now in their family where they're like, I don't want to talk to them. Those are my thoughts, right? <laughs> and I think this is a video that is like, I, and here's the thing is like reconnection and ancestor veneration isn't always comfortable. You can choose to directly heal those ancestors or you can choose to be like, ooh, no, I'm just gonna make sure I don't repeat this cycle. And that in a way is a way of healing. That is like for when we talk about like trauma and abuse survivors, that is healing. Breaking that generational cycle is healing. You don't have to call anyone into your space, especially abusers or pieces of shit in order to do that and to recognize the harm that was done by a bad ancestor. And like I said, bad ancestors and ancestors who you disagree with fundamentally or maybe you have arguments but you still want to learn from them that's something that's a different conversation but yeah i really wanted to make this video it's been on my mind a lot recently because i feel like i see a lot of comments that there's a lot of assumptions made about people on the internet and i've gotten to the point in my ancestor veneration journey where i'm able to just be like you don't know anything about me and i block <laughs> It's, it's interesting when we talk about the nuance there of ancestors being people and there are always gonna be people you don't want in your space and there are always gonna be people that you do really wanna learn from but maybe you have a disagreement and maybe there are people that support and love you no matter what. Um, and I know that a lot of my like Italian ancestors that I work with, my side of my family that were Italian immigrants, they, for the most part, support me no matter what. They're like, we love you, we're so happy you're here. And then there's my, you know, great, great grandma is like, please put a shirt on. Uh, I'm gonna have to explain this to her too. She doesn't understand the internet. So, and that's the thing too, is like, please explain the internet to your ancestors. Please explain inflation to your ancestors. I had to explain like, I can't eat bread to my ancestor. like. So it, they, there are things that they don't understand because they're from a different time. They are not, they are inside us. We hold them in our bodies. We hold them in our hearts and it's very somatic, but it's also like, once you get far enough back, they're like, what the f is going on here? What world is this? It's different. That is something to keep in mind too. You having trouble with your ancestors? Sit down and explain what's going on. <laughs> sometimes they're just confused. Um, and I think that's interesting too because a lot of people, and I think I sometimes have the assumption that my ancestors are always with me, they're always watching me, they're always making sure that they know everything about me. They don't. There are some things that maybe they see you do that they just don't understand. And maybe taking the time to explain that to them and setting a boundary with them is really important. And that is something that will be helpful to you. But thanks for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day. My off topic, but my veil's restocked. Um, this is one of them. I actually kept one for myself. This is Viridis. So if you're watching this video, there are most likely veils left. They don't really sell out the way they used to, and that's okay because it means more people can get veils and more people that aren't able to hop on right away and spend that money right away are able to shop on my store and find a veil for them. Candles are also restocked and we have little Cabrini kits, uh, which if you're interested, click the link down below, check out my offerings. And it's a great way to support me and this channel because like I said in previous videos, YouTube don't pay me like it used to. So thank you so much for supporting me and for watching this video. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Siate Benedetti.